Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Taking Control of When They'll Buy. My name is David Bick, and I'm a Vice President with Visualize, and Visualize is a proud global delivery partner of value selling. I'm coming to you today from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, Canada, where it is a gray and overcast day. So for those of you who don't know, Ottawa is the capital of Canada. So the worst thing that's going to happen today is you're going to walk away with a little bit more knowledge of geography. So, so what are we going to talk about today? Today is going to be about proven strategies, techniques, and tactics that are going to help you improve your forecast accuracy. It's going to help you determine exactly when your prospects and clients are going to buy, and it's also going to play a critical role in helping you determine if they're actually going to buy. But before we get going, let me go through a little logistics, a few of the logistics for you. I anticipate that today's call is going to take roughly 45 minutes, plus or minus a couple. We will be taking some questions and answers, so if you've got questions, please go ahead and fire them into the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. And um, the plan is that at the end, we'll roll up some of the questions and we'll answer as many as we can in the time given. My promise is to you, the ones that I can't answer, I'm, I will respond to you directly by email. All of the slides and the audio is going to be available later today for those of you who are interested and want a copy uh, and just can't get enough of my voice. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, we'll point you in the direction of where those will be. So logistics aside, um, so we at Visualize and, and value selling as a whole, we work with clients, many different industries, many different geographies and disciplines and verticals, from inside sales to global account sales to strategic account management to territory reps and channel sales. And one of the biggest challenges that is virtually universal is figuring out when our customers will buy. And doing that in a way that demonstrates us as credible, reliable, because at some point in time, we're going to be asked to put a stake in the ground. And we're going to be asked to forecast, or in some cases, predict. And we're going to have to predict what the business is and when's it coming in. And really today, that's what we're going to be talking about is the whole concept of forecast accuracy. I'm having a little challenge here. Uh, Chris, are you able to, um, just as a side, uh, get my slides moving forward for me, please? And bear with us, folks. Just bear with us. Yeah, thanks. Cool, come here. Is that, is that something you can do for us, Chris? Yeah, we're we're, we're working on it right now. Okay, thanks. Um, bear with us. Uh, there we go. Good stuff. Set Thank you. Now. Yep. It's all good. Thank you very much. So let's think towards the balance of 2016 and how many, how much time do we actually have to get our year-end deals done? Well, as of Monday, there are 50 working days left in the year, but that really doesn't take into account statutory holidays. And I know we've all done them, or we've all got them. And I did a quick Google search, and U.S. Thanksgiving that takes at least two days, providing the tryptophan and the turkey wears off. Um, I believe Revolution Day in Mexico is a statutory holiday. That's one day. And then UK, we've got Christmas and Boxing Days, which is two days right there. So that leaves us probably 45 official working days. And when we subtract our clients and our prospects time off, I'm thinking we're probably getting close to 40 days or less. And remember, we're not the only ones vying for our clients and our prospects' attention to get our deals done. But I think you're starting to get the picture and the reasons why we can't hope that a miracle happens to get our deals done. Let's look at some of the scenarios here. There's kind of two, two perspectives we want. If you're a manager, does this resonate with you that salespeople sometimes tell you what you want to hear as opposed to what's really going on because they figure, well, maybe that's going to actually buy me some time to you know, get the deal in good shape and that it might close on time? And do we often look at forecasting as a once a month event? that it's on my calendar, I do it at a specific point in time, and then I move on to just doing what I do. And oftentimes we don't reassess or update what's actually going on in a consistent fashion. And at the same time, from the rep side, and I think we can all raise our hand about this one, but 
do we have deals that we've been working on for months and months and months that are just still in the forecast and we just can't get them out? You know, I was talking to a rep the other day and he was telling me that he's been working on a deal in the pipeline for nine months, which is three times longer than any other deal he's been working on. And the question we really got to was, what is that a deal or not? And why is it still in the forecast? Secondly, the, the other thing that I hear from reps all the time is they have to forecast a goal, not what they feel comfortable that is actually going to come in. And they say to me, I have to forecast a certain amount or, you know, I'm going to be in trouble and there's going to be a performance issue. So the question becomes, is the foundation for accuracy there when we can be sometimes seen as pulling numbers out of the air? So let's tie this to what the experts are telling us. And for those of you who know serious decisions or those who don't, they provide research guidance and advice to CMOs and chief sales officers around the world. They say that they suggest that more than two thirds of sales leaders are concerned that they're not aligned to their client's buying process. Over half of the companies win less than 25% of the, 25 of the deals they're pursuing. And only 10% of companies can get within 5% of a forecast 90 days out. I mean, these are pretty sobering numbers. And it can, you can see how this is going to start to drive some behaviors. So let's now connect that to the agenda for today's call. Three things that we're going to be walking through. Number one, the technique of building a timeline. And we're going to use reverse engineering to think about building a timeline with our clients that are actually going to put specificity in what's got to happen for them to make a buying decision. And most importantly, to execute that buying decision with you. Number two, we're going to look at how using written communications can be a customer specific tool that's going to help, them motiv going to help motivate them to act sooner rather than later. And we're going to discuss how the technique wrappers itself around the customer's goals not our goals. And lastly, the third thing that we're going to address is how when we do these things well, well, we're going to be in a position to, to demonstrate ourselves and as credible and the fact that we know what's going on in our patch. And what's that going to lead to? Well, it's going to lead to more business, more commissions, promotions. For those of you who listen to Simon Sinek, it's going to be the ability for us to fulfill our personal and professional uh, why. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a question for the group today. And I'm going to open up the poll in a second, but this is going to be wrapped around the question of, is forecasting an art or a science? So I'm going to open up the poll, and you'll see there are three questions here. One, is it more art than science? Is it more science than art? Or is it about equal parts? So go ahead, click on one. Hit submit, and we'll start to see where some of the answers are going to come in and give us a little bit of a benchmark to, uh, to drive some of our discussions. So let's see what we're getting. Hmm, not much art, a little bit more science, yeah, and about the same. And as the numbers come in, it's pretty consistent with what I hear when I talk to sales executives and senior leaders. And you know, those who believe that it's more science believe that they can create algorithms and use enablement tools to absolutely predict what's going to close and when. And others, it's a little bit about the data, it's a little bit about the science, but they still believe that gut instinct and you know, maybe it's pixie dust that we as sales put on the deals. And the majority of them agree with the, the group here that it's a lot about both. And you know, it is about blending the art and the science, the intuition, the gut feel, but with what we really critically need to know and have to know to build around that science. And I think a lot of it's true that it's both. So with these numbers in front of us, we're going to talk today about some of the art, some of the science behind our deals, and that we have to drive a more complete understanding of what's going on in our customer's world. What it boils down to, folks, I think you'll agree, is that sales, it's a communication game. And so our ability to effectively communicate with prospects, prospects is going to be what ultimately makes the difference for us. The other thing, the second thing to consider as we move forward is if we can control everything and actually execute the purchases for our clients, I think our win rate would be up around 100%. But the reality is there are things that we have absolutely no control over. And I don't care you know, how much training you apply to it, there are things we're just not going to get control over. But I want us to think about building a foundation to be very deliberate and very effective with what it is that we can absolutely control. So let's take a look at the current situation that may be driving some of the behaviors. And when we're thinking about how we predict the future and how we drive forecasts. So there's more and more pressure to accurately forecast. 
You know, there's more scrutiny from the markets, investors, stakeholders. I was speaking to a head of sales the other day, and she said that the VCs who made early investments in their company were looking for predictable results from their investments. And forecast accuracy was a huge part of what she was challenged with because this was the ability to give the investors what they want, what's coming back to us. Number two, well, do we not have enough tools to do the analysis right now? Because the sense is, sales leaders tell me, we don't need yet another tool to analyze the data. Time is of the essence, and you know, I, I don't think we have the resources to be able to go out and do more analysis. What we hear and what I think the, the current situation is, we need better information and we need better inputs as opposed to just more analysis on them. The third thing is our credibility inside and, the, uh, inside and outside the organization is on the line every day. And this goes from frontline sales right up to managers to the heads of sales. If we can't get a handle on our forecasts, then we may not be viewed as credible and in control of our territory and franchise. And what does that say about our personal brand? And lastly, those organizations that can get a handle on forecast accuracy absolutely outperform those that don't. And the best lesson I ever received was something that happened earlier in my career. I was working for a Fortune 500 manufacturing company. I was having a conversation with one of the plant manuf manufacturers, and it was a little place called the little town in Fergus, Ontario, northwest of Toronto. The plant manager was lamenting to me that the finance would not approve a new piece of equipment because sales forecast had been way off for the previous X number of quarters. And without knowing the dollars that would be in the bank to pay for the capital investment, the finance group wouldn't approve the purchase. Iron the most ironic part of this whole thing is the new equipment would have been a huge sales competitive advantage for us. And my sense is it was kind of like a dog chasing its tail is, you know, we wanted the competitive advantage and that would have given us more forecast accuracy, but we couldn't have it. And so it was a little bit of a, a dog chasing its tail. Now, I think it would be great if this was our baseline for forecast accuracy, the local weather person. They seem to be able to change day to day, positive to negative, negative to positive, and as a golfer, this resonates with me, but they seem to have no repercussions. And I imagine they feel it's part art, part science as well, but I don't think we've ever heard of a weather person being fired for being wrong too often. So let's take a look at what are some of the factors that actually influence our ability to drive accurate forecasts. And what I'm gonna ask the group to do is, let's go into the Q&A panel and just start to fire up some answers, one or two words, about what is it that's in your world that drives your ability or the factors that hinder or impact your ability to forecast accurately. So based on what you sell, where you sell, the type of clients you have, just go in there and answer some, you know, give me one or two words about what are some of the things that you see as factors driving forecast accuracy. Okay, so starting to see a couple come through here. All right. What are we seeing? A couple of things. Don't have access to someone who can buy. I see funding right now. Um, absolutely. What else is coming in? I've got a scroll. Um, yeah, micromanagement, the election, absolutely. Clients don't know their own processes. Absolutely great answers, I love those. And I'll tell you what, let me, let me fire up what it is that we see from a consistent basis from our clients. And these are some of the things that we see from our clients and prospects. And we really see some of the very same things that you're seeing out there. You know, somebody mentioned the politics. That's absolutely gonna have an impact. And once a new government comes in and having sold to the Canadian government in the past, well, if you get a change of regime or even a new or the same party come in, things are going to slow or speed up depending upon their policies. You know, the economy, compensation, T's and C's. Have we ever been down the path with a deal and all of a sudden we flip over the T's and C's and you know what? It's a whole new kettle of fish. Somebody else has to get involved in it and it, you know, every, everything goes off the rails. Weather, yeah. I think weather is one of those things that, you know, not sure if anybody pointed it out, but if you live in the East Coast of the United States, think about the storms that have hit there. And that impacts the client's ability to, yeah, get to a meeting. So we might miss something, might be lagged a couple of days. So when, when, when we look at all of these factors, they're really going to impact how it is that we can drive accurate forecasts. And when I think about these things, I'm often reminded of one of my first mentors, a guy called Scotty. And Scotty's unfortunately no longer with us, but on my first day working with Scotty, he sat me down 
and he pulled out a piece of paper and he drew a big circle. And then he drew a smaller circle inside that big circle. And he said, Dave, the outer circle is my sphere of concern. It's all the things that I'm worried about, but that I can't affect. The smaller circle, the inner circle, was my sphere of control. Those were the things that I could absolutely control and impact. He told me, my job, grow the smaller circle to ensure that I control as much as I possibly could about, given a, about a given situation. I'll tell you, that was great advice that really has stood the test of time for me. So the key question that we're really trying to answer here is, at the end of the day, when are they going to buy? Now, hopefully it's not if they're going to buy, because that indicates that there are things in our sales process that are undiscovered, right? that we have to address that we haven't addressed, or that we have to discover from our clients. But assuming they've made the decision, yes, they're going to buy, figuring out when they're going to buy, is really the key to accurately forecast. And the underlying question that I want you to keep in the back of your mind is, how do I reduce the risk? And this is for both parties. For you, let's reduce the risk that the deal goes off the rails. And for our clients and prospects, if they are far enough down the path with us that they can see that we absolutely can address their business outcomes, Right? We want to reduce the risk that this deal is going to fall apart from their perspective. Because if they want us and they can see the end, beautiful. Then we're in, the, we're in the right place with them. So when will they buy? And think in the back of your mind, how do I reduce the risk? So for those of you who are value selling practitioners, this diagram should really be familiar to you. And to those of you who are new to value selling, this is one of the essences of how we do things. Now, before, I want to, before we get into the details of if and when they're going to buy, let's make sure we understand what's going on in the decision-making process so that the inputs confirm that we're on track to drive deals in our favor. And as we go through this, think back to that serious decision stat that 67% of organizations are not aligned to their clients and prospects' business process. I had a conversation with a VP of sales, I think it was about three weeks ago, and he said, Dave, here's the challenge. We've got a, we got a pretty healthy pipeline. We've got busy salespeople meeting with what I think are the right people, and I think talking about the right things, but at the end of the day, nothing's closing when we think it should. Started to have a conversation, started digging a little bit deeper into the pipeline, and the discovery we both kind of came to was that the reps were asking pretty good situational questions, closing questions, they were trying to drive towards a level of transaction or relationship, but it became apparent that something was really missing earlier in the sales cycle. It could have been anything from not solving problems that were worth solving that drive business outcomes. Could have been they were talking to people who couldn't buy. People like, maybe it could be that they weren't answering the question, should they even buy? So when we look at this from kind of that idea of purchasing as a process, and I don't mean purchasing department, because that can be the bane of our, decision, uh, bane of our existence, but I'm talking about the whole decision process within an organization to make a purchase with you. And how is it that the client builds a business case to invest in your solutions or your offerings. So let's go one level of, of, of context above this slide. I think if we're in a classroom and I did a poll, I think we could agree that a business's reason for being in business is profitability, right? Government, if you sell the government or not for, for uh, profit, the objective is fulfillment of the organization's mandate. But for today's purposes, we're gonna use private sector the objective of an organization, the business objective is profitability. So let's take that as a granted. To get somebody to make a business decision to do business with you, the first thing we've got to uncover is what is it the organization must address or resolve at the C level that drives the business objective? Remember profitability? We call that capital B, capital I business issue. And the sales professionals that we work with, we teach them to elevate the conversations above the solutions and connect to that real measurable impact that's going to that's going to drive the business outcomes. A few examples of the business issue could be for the VP of sales growth, for the CFO cost management or compliance, and for the CMO could be market share. Each one of these C-level executives maybe has one or two critical business issues that they've got to deliver on. So once we've got that business issue in focus and the prospect acknowledges it, and ideally we've got them to quantify it by how much and by when, then what we need to do is understand what's holding them back from achieving those business issues. What are the roadblocks? What are the obstacles? Or as we've got here, what are the problems? 
Do they have technical challenges? Is it a human resource deficiency? Are there process issues or process? And it usually comes down to those three things, people, process, and tools. And when we're looking at this from a kind of a, what do, how, do, how do we impact this, is do we have the ability through questioning to inject things that the client may not have thought about? Can we grow that problem box? So once we've got their confirmation that these are the problems holding them back, we move on to get their vision of the solution that the client feels will solve the problems. Maybe they go hire people, maybe they build something themselves, maybe they outsource the capability to a partner or to you to solve that problem. But it's really got to be the client's vision. In the majority of the cases, our solution, our capability, our offerings are one piece of the puzzle. And by getting the client's view of what are all the things they're thinking about, we can properly slot ourselves in and tie to the other things that they're doing. And if we do our job and we align the things that, we align the things that differentiate our solutions and the pro, to the problems that the clients face, we're building what we call a vision match. Actually, we want to ultimately get to what we call a differentiated vision match. And we call it that because, well, it's the prospects that our clients go through, whether it's subconsciously or consciously, and they're trying to determine whether or not we are the best alternative to solve those problems and ultimately impact the business. And it's a differentiated vision match when the client agrees that we are the only ones who can solve that problem and help them achieve their business issue. So let's assume that we've gone through, we've done a great job, the client agrees. Well, what's the next thing we have to do and where do we go to next? We've got to look at, is it worth it to invest in this? How much ROI? What's going to be my return to, that, that, that I'm going to get from solving these problems? Am I going to spend a buck to make five, or am I going to spend five to make a buck? If you look at those two scenarios, both are absolutely no-brainers. One's going to result in a handshake and a purchase, and the other's going to result in a handshake and them showing you the door. But as a sales professional, we need to gain the skills to get very deliberate and very specific in quantifying the impact that we have on our clients. And if we tie a tie few of these things together, well, think about how is it that our differentiated solutions can solve unique problems and value comes out of problems being solved. So if we solve unique problems that our competitors can't, that's value that accrues to us that our competitors don't get access to. The other thing we've got to think about is due diligence around the value that's in it for our prospects and our clients. What's really motivating them? And we call this personal value. And I think we can all, we can all kind of you know, talk about times when we've seen people move mountains for their own personal interests. I, I would take you back to a situation where you as a sales professional worked hours at the end of the month, end of the quarter, end of the year to bring in a deal and you were heroic. And did you do it because well, it was the right thing for your company? Probably not. That might have been a small part of the puzzle, but you were probably doing it because there was commission, there was recognition, there was a trip, there was things you could do for your spouse. That's your personal value. So are we being diligent about getting our client's personal value? The next piece of the puzzle really is understanding who can say yay or nay, yes or no, power. That's the essence of power. And I'm not going to get all technical in terms of all the different types of power, but let's boil it down to those people who can say yes and those people who can say no. And oftentimes when we're in an organization, we're working with people who are doing evaluations, comparisons, due diligence, and they're trying to decide on alternatives and then flipping it over to people who actually are making the decision. Do we understand those processes? Do we understand who actually has power? And do we have the world in their context? Do we understand their view of the business issue, the problems, the solutions? Have we mapped this process to them? And last but not least, we're working the plan to convert a prospect to a, prospect to a customer and deliver on the value they're expected to receive. Because when we're doing those types of things, when we're building that plan out, there's many things that they'll want to see. They'll want to see maybe a demo, a POC, a trial. They might want to speak to a reference. They might want to get additional support from a sales engineer. They might want to talk to a consultant. But whatever it's involved in the plan that we're building with the clients, it's all got to be around convincing them to buy. So one of the most effective things that we can do to put a wrapper around this process, it can be summarized by the plan letter. 
And this is what we want to create with our prospect. And we use it to support and reinforce all the confirmations that we have with them all the way through the process that we've talked about. And in my experience, the plan letter is one of those things that's really overlooked in many sales organizations that we work with. Reps are professional. They're good at generating solid follow-up after every meeting. And I don't think I've ever talked to a rep that doesn't believe it's important for time we follow up after a meeting, whether it's phone or in person. But the challenge is, does the follow-up support your ability to reinforce the client's reason to buy and to buy from you? And if we think about that email that we're sending to them, because that's generally how we're doing follow-up, is it going to re reinforce that decision? Is it going to reinforce that procurement purchase that we laid out to you before? Does it help the client build that business case? So let's look at the plan letter we've got here. I've laid out the business issue. Remember that C-level priority that they've got to achieve, growth, cost management, new product to market, whatever it is. I'm going to then layer in the problems that are holding them back. And this is where, if I've done my job right, I inject problems they hadn't thought about. I can bring industry insights to bear. I'm going to play back to the client what it is their vision of the solutions and capabilities are. They're going to solve those problems. And last but not least, I'm going to pull in what is the impact, the value that they're going to receive, and the results. And again, this has got to be in the client's viewpoint. And as I learn more and more from the customer or the prospect, well, I'm just going to add more specificity to my plan, and I'm going to build it out. So in the second call, I might learn more about value or solution, whatever it is, and I just build on this template. And I actually had it the other day where I sent a, a plan letter back to a, a, a prospect, and I actually said around value, look, we need to spend more time. We've got to blow this out because we both need to understand what is the impact of solving these problems? How is that going to connect back up to their reason to do business with us, which is the end goal? And one last little point is when we're talking about impact, the impact has got to connect to the business issues. So if they're talking about cost management and the impact is really it's about growth, yeah, no, we're not, we're not aligned whatsoever. So this becomes one of your standard operating procedures to help you sell when you're not in front of the client because it reinforces the discussion and it reinforces their reasons to buy. And it also gives them a chance to provide any additional context. Another thing you're going to notice about this format is, well, who's it about? Because it's not about us as the seller. It's about the client. It's about them. It's about their goals. And if we think about Stephen Covey and it's, Think with the end in mind. Well, what's the end? The end is solving their business issue. So I may actually, as part of this, I might attach an overview of something I want them to get, some product knowledge, maybe it's a webinar, something that will help move the, win, move the, uh, the deal along. But this has got to be, this general plan, it's got to be about them. And I'm reminded of a, a situation where a rep brought me in, uh, I think it was about two years ago on a call. It was a second call. They had done the discovery and they were playing back to the client what it is they understood and they were starting to make some, some kind of high level linkages. And at the end of the meeting, again, remember this is the second meeting, the client said, or the prospect said to the rep, he said, Jim, what I loved about the last two meetings was you focused on what's important to me. You focused on my issues, my challenges. And he said, and as a result, I'm really looking forward to finding out what it is that you guys really do and how it is that you can drive some of these things for me. So kind of a nice validation that the plan, the plan letter, the plan approach has got to be about them. So as I summarize all these things that I've done, the second piece then becomes what is that timeline of activities? What have we done? What do we need to do? By when and ideally for whom? We want to build up some accountability. And things that we're going to include in here, what, are the, what, what have we actually done to date? Because we don't want it all to be about the future. Let's let the client know all these things that we've done. Because think about them flipping this over to their boss. Wow, you guys have really spent a lot of time building this out. Nice job. Do we have access to power? Do we need to build that in? You know, all the way down through to thinking about this is not a Gantt chart. This is a sales tool. And I'm going to go back to that Stephen Covey line. Think with the end in, mean, end in mind. This is not about building a plan to finish at contract sign or go live. That's your interest as a seller. What does the client care about? 
They care about achieving their goal, their business issue. They want to see value realized. So we have to give them a view of the world of what's going to happen after the contract sign and how are we going to ensure that we actually get the ROI that they asked for. So we've got to think about thinking with the end in mind. Think about the last time that you made a major purchase. Maybe it was a, a new home. Maybe it was a vehicle. Maybe it was a big, big family vacation you were spending thousands on. Were you not worried about everything that could and would go wrong? Our prospects and clients feel the exact same way, and that's why the plan has got to think about all the things before contract to make sure they're going to sign, and then it's got to think about all the things. It's got to take into account all the things after the contract is signed to ensure that we can deliver value and that the client can get value because that's what they care about. And the concept of this reverse engineering to gain attention sooner rather than later is really effective at determining when they're going to buy because when I start assigning a timeline, and we haven't done it here, but we could put dates on there. We could put who's got the accountability and responsibility on there. And when things from their side slip, we can hold them to task. And not for the task item, but for what's the impact that's going to be on the schedule, on the time that they need to see value. And if we, always, we also look at this, that if the client buys into it, well, then you've got a shared vision of how things are going to work out, and you've got more accuracy in your forecast. You can look at your boss in the eye and say, hey, this is what the client and I agree. He said yes. She said yes. This is the plan. They know it's going to close in December. I know it's going to close in December. Now, let's go back to the factors influencing our forecast excellence. It's not to say that, Mother Nature is not going to dump two feet of snow in the East Coast and everybody in Atlanta is going to take, you know, miss two days worth of work. And, um, but it does mean at that point in time, we've got a vision with the client that we're in concert with them. Now, I've never been able to figure out how to control the weather. When I do, I'll let you know. So the plan line is absolutely critical. And another way to describe the plan letter and the plan schedule is that it's a customer-specific tool that's going to allow us to differentiate ourselves from the competitors, and that's two ways. One is it's going to show you as focusing on the value of what it is that we do, not the order. And I'll tell you, when, when I do a poll in a classroom about how many people think that the plan ends at contract sign, it's surprisingly high. The second way that this is going to differentiate us is the client's going to look at us differently. They're going to look at us as a business consultant. Interestingly enough, when I talk to reps and I ask, well, why don't we build plans like this now? The biggest thing we get is time, the time it takes to do this. So think in your head, how long would it take for a deal right now that you've got? How long would it take for you to build a best-in-class plan letter plan schedule? And now think about how much time would it take to build the second one? Because I know salespeople love to cut and paste and reuse. It's probably going to take half the time. So could this not be an insurance policy towards your deal slipping and sliding? And on the upside, it's going to bring deals in when they're supposed to, and the clients are going to look at you much, much differently. So the last point that I want to make here when it comes to plans and the plan schedule is it's got to be mutual. The prospect has got to agree to it, and ideally there are things that they're accountable for. I mean, is there not a better way to ensure that they're bought into a plan that they've actually got, quote, unquote, skin in the game? They've got things to do, and it doesn't have to be a laundry list. And again, I'll give you another example of, of somebody I was working with, and um, it was a rep on the East Coast. She had done a great job on discovery. She had done a great job on the solution, and she had sent the last version of the plan letter to the prospect. And she called me. It was two weeks later, and she was in a panic, and Dave... I'm freaking out. My deal is dead. I said, well, help me understand what's going on. And she said, I sent the plan letter to the prospect, and I haven't heard back. It's been radio silence for two weeks. Okay. So in my effort to talk her off the ledge, I said, well, send me the plan letter. Let me, let me, let me kind of triage this for you. Send it to me. I read through it, and I had a comment and a question back to her. My comment was, this has got to be one of the best plan letters I've ever seen. It's detailed, it's specific, it goes beyond contract sign, it's written, it's beautiful. My question is, what is it that the client has to do? And there was silence and then there was an OMG moment. She just said, oh my goodness, I've asked nothing of the client. 
She said, I didn't even ask the person to respond that I've captured everything accurately. So she dumped me on the phone right then and there, called the prospect and said, hey, look, I never asked you the question. Are you on board? And she said, yeah, I, I was traveling a little bit, but absolutely, I love what you laid out and I'm looking forward to next steps. Kind of a cool little story, just the, uh, th that one has always resonated with me. So something to consider. Four things. Please put the plan in writing, right? The written word allows us to overcome any misunderstandings, misconceptions, a chance for people to respond and say, yeah, you know what? You didn't actually, act, actually, actually act, accurately capture that. Wow, that's a tough word. Second thing is it's a proactive way to manage the steps in the sales cycle. It's a great way for us to be able to sell when we're not in front of the client. Thirdly, it minimizes plan creep. And, and I'll get you to think, has anybody been in a situation where they've had things inserted at the end of a deal? Oh, no, we want to do this, 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 and this. Well, if we're very upfront with the client, we're building out these plans as we go, we're reducing the likelihood that the plan is going to move. And quite frankly, when they do start to inject something into it, well, we can bargain that you're asking for something. Okay, great. Can we get this? And maybe it's access to power. When they ask, we ask for something back once we've identified the value of it. Remember, please, for the love of goodness, do not underestimate the amount of power that you have in a deal. Cool. Cool. So let's think then about when we're working through deals. Uh, you know, if, if we don't have high quality interactions and we're not learning a lot from the prospects early in the sales cycle, we're never going to be able to generate a great plan letter because the input to the plan letter is the voice of the client. It's what they think. It's what they feel. It's what they've told us and we're confirming it back and it's not about what we think. And I'll tell you, and for those of you who felt this moment when you sent out a great plan letter, there's no better feeling than a client coming back and saying, you know what, that was spot on. You've captured everything perfectly. Thank you. And I actually had somebody come back to me and say, thank you just for listening. Kind of, again, nice feeling, but it drives a wedge between you and your competitors. So when we're going through deals, there's only three outcomes of a deal, right? Win, lose, no decision. That's it. And in our experience, in my experience, the most expensive outcome of these, and I could do a polling question, I do this all the time in the classroom, we ask, what's the most expensive outcome that can happen out of those three? I was going to say that's a binary decision. It's not. I don't know if trinary is a word. But of these three, the most overwhelmingly expensive is no decision. And no decision from two perspectives. One, they take an emotional toll on us. We can't close a deal. We can't understand why the deal is not closing. We start to question ourselves. We question our abilities. Our managers question us. And the deals that are installed and the, the ones that are no decision, those are the ones that we, well, we then go and put critical resources at play to get them unstuck. And these resources are usually in short supply. And I'm talking about we bring in our boss, our boss's boss. We bring in the head of product management. We bring in a consultant. These are you know, exponentially more expensive things that we do to try to unstick a deal. And remember, when you look at your pipeline, those are the deals that are just staring up at you with those big puppy dog eyes. Please, I want to close. But we just don't know what to do. So how do we act then? How do, what do we do? When we've got these deals in our pipeline and we want to move them forward, we want to reduce the no decisions and the losses. And quite frankly, if we can get to no quicker, I'm happy. And I often hear from reps and they, what they tell me is that, look, I'm inspected on my pipeline, but I'm inspected on what's going to close and when's it going to close. But I'm very rarely holistically coached through a process that allows me to get some insights into what's missing. And how often is it that we look at a deal through the lens of, Really, what do I know and what do I not know to move a deal forward as opposed to, well, you know what, I really hope that I've got all the bases covered. For that, I'm going to introduce you to a tool. And those of you who, again, are steeped in value selling, you will have seen this before. But it is the Opportunity Assessment Tool, something that I have referred to in the past, our own BS detector. At Visualize, we've got a couple of guides that help people dive deeper and deeper into the details surrounding the deals because ideally we want to work with the opportunity owner or a manager, 
or if it's our own, we want to be very honest with ourselves, but we want to really drive to verify and clarify our depth of understanding and ensure that we're focused on the right things that are going to be an accelerant to getting the deal unstuck. And the best example I can give you here is on line one. Not only do we need to ensure we know the business issue, but we have to make a distinction between a C-level business issue, remember capital B, capital I, and a project or a problem. For those of you, again, who know value selling, we talked that projects and problems can come and go. They're at the whim of budget or organizational changes. But true business issues are there for the longer term. Revenue management, or revenue, cost management, productivity, to name just a few. And remember, those things are owned at the executive level. And those business issues rarely, if ever, go away. The only thing that really goes away is the executive who doesn't deliver on those outcomes. And so this tool helps us drive clarity with that understanding and get ourselves on solid ground. Or it can help us build a plan to, to really detail what it is that we need to know and maybe how to go back to the client, ask some great questions to unstick a deal. And I've often said to, to reps that this is a great way to be honest with yourselves. And if I picked up the phone and I was working through an opportunity assessment with you, if I called the prospect, would they say exactly what you've written down in the opportunity assessment tool? Again, we've got to be honest with ourselves. The other overriding challenge that we see with our clients is around forecast accuracy is they just don't have the depth in their pipeline. So we're talking about good opportunities, but they may not be fully baked and they may not be ready to close until Q1 or Q2. And if we feel that pressure to forecast, remember, not what I can commit to, but what that goal is that's been given to me from on high. Well, am I going to do some unnatural things to pull a deal forward? Am I going to give them a discount at the wrong time? Am I going to include something that I shouldn't? I think about talking to a friend of mine who was an infrastructure guy. He was a director of infrastructure, and he was talking to me about um, a rep who had come in to see him, and I'm not, you know, no company. I'm not even going to tell you what the technology was, but the guy said, can I come and talk to you and understand your environment? Obviously, the rep was under high pressure to forecast and for, you know, get, get his forecast under play because at the end of an hour-long discovery meeting, he had offered him an 80% discount if he signed that day. And the guy said, my buddy said, there's no way. I can't do it. And the guy said, well, what about 90%? So let's make sure that we've got a broad enough and a deep enough funnel that we've got enough opportunities in there that are short-term, medium-term, and long-term. So let me take a moment now to summarize a little bit about what we talked about this, this afternoon. And I'm going to open it up to Q&A for the group. So if you've got a question, please, please feel to fire it into the, uh, the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, and we'll, we'll take a moment or two to triage those. So what are our key takeaways from today? Number one, if things aren't closing, use the opportunity assessment tool to understand what's missing, because I'll bet you dollars to donuts that something critical is missing. And it could be anything from a lack of differentiation, not connecting to the right problems to solve that we're talking to people who can't buy to. We haven't done a good job of convincing them, but I can guarantee you that something is missing and we have to figure out a way to connect back and open up the conversation to get that sales cycle back on track. The other thing that we need to do, and, and one of the things I love about the, the value selling process is its flexibility. Every client that we work with has a different buying process and a different time timetable. And whether you're calling on a small business or a Fortune 100 company, they've all got different approaches to it. But I've talked to executives, and I ask people all the time about this. And what they consistently tell me is those six conversational buckets that we, we did in that qualification as a process slide, those are absolutely critical to building a business case. What is it that I have to deliver? What's holding me back? What do I see as the solutions? What's the return? Who else do I need to have involved? And what is the plan to ensure that I see the ROI that I'm in, investing in? So what we want to do is we want to use that to turn, um, we want to use the, the plan, or, sorry, we want to use the plan, which is the next piece, which is creating this mutual plan to be our GPS on those deals. And remember what we talked about. A great, a great plan is it's mutual. The client's got skin in the game. It's written. It's detailed, and remember, it goes past contract signed to when the client is actually going to see value. 
And in what's probably our captain obvious moment of the day is, last but not least, we've got to make sure that we've got a good pipeline. Are we adding things on a consistent basis so we're not clinging to details and the deals in the pipeline that are never going to close, are going to close but on a much different timeline than what we hope they are. Remember that idea of we hope they are, and that we're doing those unnatural things to the deals to unstick. So a couple of things to think about for you today, and I'll tell you what, when all else fails, when nothing else is working, well, here's your approach to, to, to how you set your forecast. You do it after the deals actually come in. So why don't we take a moment and look at some of the, uh, the questions and, uh, that, have, that have come in. And um, I'm going to go through these. Great. So let's just see. How do you, how do you, have you experienced the integration of these tools into the sales, uh, salesforce.com? Absolutely. Um, we do that for folks every day. That is a big part of it. And the reason that we put these in, for those of you who value selling, we put the value prompter, which is the thing that prompts our conversation into it, because rarely do sales reps get, and if there's anybody in sales enablement here, you've never heard me say this, but rarely do sales reps get much out of a sales force or a, a CRM. When we integrate the process into Salesforce, or into, into a CRM, you actually get something back that you can use. You get templates back. You get questions. You get, you get a way to navigate the conversation. I hope that helps. Um, second question uh, I've got here is, how detailed should the plan timeline be? And for those of you who, um, who know me and I laugh when I put this, is I often answer a question with a question, but... Uh, I think it was Abe Lincoln who one time said when asked, how long should a man's legs be? And he said, long enough to touch the ground. So how, long, how much detail should be in a planned timeline? As much as it takes for the client to be convinced to buy. It could be a very complex scenario, and maybe they need a ton of stuff before contract signs, so you build out that timeline with the client. Maybe they need to see a bunch of things afterwards. But it really comes down to what is it that they need to see and what do you need? Now, I'll, I'll, let me give you another little example. Um, we're a talk, and I go back to this guy, Jim, and he did something beautiful in a, in a prospect meeting. They were down talking about timelines and they were talking about activities. And Jim went up to the board and he drew a timeline. And he drew today on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side was value realized and in the middle was contract signed. And he stepped back and he stood beside the client. And he gave the client the uh, marker and he said, can you go up and can you put on two or three activities that you need to see? And I don't care where it is, but that you need to see so that we get the deal done and that you actually get what you want from an ROI perspective. Client did that. Jim came up. He added two or three to them. Give it back to the client. By the time they were done, there was 20 items on that list and it was a thing of beauty. And interestingly enough, Jim took a picture and sent that back to the client as the, as the plan timeline. It was beautiful. Point is, the plan timeline has as much detail as is required in the situation to convince the client to buy. All right, um, let's go to the next one. Uh, is there a more effective way of uncovering pain? When we're talking about a discovery call and... Um, if you, again, I'll, I'll talk in terms of how value selling approaches the questioning process. If we're looking at getting, if, if we've got the client to articulate their business issues, so what is it that I have to deliver this year, you know, how much by when, I want to ask the client an open question. So what is it, Joe, Bob, Betty, what is it that you see as the impediments to hitting that target? I want them to talk. I really want to get them to provide some level of detail. And I might ask them, you know, can you tell me more about that? Can you drill down on it? And then I'm going to come prepared with questions that I know. So I could say, you know, hey, Joe, another client that we work with experiences this as a challenge. Is that something you're considering or you're concerned about? And I want to get really good at asking questions that I prepare in advance because those questions should ultimately lead to things that we are uniquely qualified to solve that are differentiators for us. So I'm going to go in with five or six of these probing questions that are going to really help me drive that discussion with the client and get to those, again, you've called it pain points. We call them the problems and the problems that are holding them back from achieving their business issues. 
I hope that really helps. Um, one last question before we wrap up, and I like this one. When should we send a plan letter? Early and often. I send a plan letter after each call, and it doesn't have to be anything. It's not on glossy, stationary. It could be an email. And I've got a specific template. You know, thanks for the time. Here's what you told me. Here's the next steps. And I identify in there the things that I know and I don't know. So I would say early and often is your best bet. And in the timelines, you're going to start to build. You know, I'll go back on the second one and say, great. So what's in red is what I learned from our conversation on Tuesday. And we're building this out. And I'm adding more activities. And it's really interesting to see how it is that the clients really latch on to that in my mind because we're playing back for them their words. It helps them get clarity. And in some cases, they're going to say, you know what, eh, actually, I missed this. And I did actually miss one where I misheard a guy about power. And he came back and he said, yeah, no, we really got to look at this. So if I wasn't going early and often, if I just did one, I would have been toast with understanding who power really was. So, Folks, it's now 10 minutes to the hour. I would love to give you all back, well, it's now nine minutes. I would love to give you back nine minutes in your day. A uh, couple of things to finish off, and the people whose questions I didn't get to answer, I will respond by email. A uh, couple of things to wrap up with. This is where you are going to find the audio and video transcripts. So for those of you who will really miss my voice at the end of the call, feel free, valueselling.com resources webinars. And last but not least, I want to give you a hold the date or a save the date for the next upcoming webinar, which is November 17th, same bat time, same bat channel. Switch it up. Focus on value rather than price. And this is going to be hosted by our own infamous Julie Thomas, who is the president of Value Selling Associates. So that really, folks, should be a do not miss event for you. So I'm going to wrap it up. If anybody wants to reach out to me by email, feel free, LinkedIn, um, whatever it is, I'd be more than happy to connect with you. If you've got specific questions, love to, to field them with you. At some point in time, this screen is going to build with my, uh, with my credentials. Um, but I do want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of the day. I hope that this is going to help you drive deals, be better, better at forecasting, and ultimately be able to get to fulfilling your why. So everybody, thank you so much. Really appreciate the time. Have a great day.